So, okay, welcome back. Um, hope everybody is healthy. Everybody's doing okay. It's, um, we are on the third week, the end of the third week. It seems a little bit unreal that we're still doing this, and it seems like we're going to be doing this for a while. However, there's something to be said about this format. I'm actually kind of enjoying it. I know some of you are um, having a little bit of problems with um, with responding to some of the lectures. And I just want to let you know that anything that is going on, I understand you just need to reach out to me, but I need you to start responding to some of these lectures. So today, um, I think we are going to talk about, not I think, we're going to talk about public performances in colonial Latin America. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do that, it's because we started talking about that in the last video, in the last class, but we concentrated on images or on, on, on the performances of the Inquisition. But yes, while I wanted to give you a perspective that the colonial period was this oppressive period, right? That it was a little, it's, it was, it's very complicated. Um, I still wanted to show you that the performance of power was everywhere. The performance of power, it happened all the time. And it wasn't only just at the hands of the Inquisition, but it was in, in different institutions were performing that at all times. And I wanted to start, I wanted to start, um, I wanted to start this with a quote um, by Ma Mari Mariano Picon Salas, and it says, the Baroque was one of the most profoundly, no, profound key, <laughs> as I wrote right here, rooted elements of tradition on our culture. In spite of nearly two centuries of encyclopedism and modern criticism, we Hispanic Americans have not yet fully emerged from its labyrinth. And this is a quote from the 60s, I believe. So um, there's, instead of putting encyclopedism, think about the, the internet era. And it's still true. This, this quote is still true to this day. Americans have not yet fully emerged from its labyrinth. Again, um, Hispanic Americans have not yet fully emerge from its labyrinth. It still heavily influences our aesthetic sensibility and many complex aspects of our collective psychology. And I wanted to start with this because when we refer to the Baroque, it's not just about painting. It's not just about sculpture. When we talk about the Baroque, we're talking about a whole entire society. And I already mentioned that the term Baroque to simply describe painting of Latin America it's complicated and it's not that easy. And it's something that pertains more specifically to Italy. However, um, we can think of this counter-reformative era. We can think about the era of the Baroque. And as, as being mentioned by other authors, the Baroque was this era of the awe. The idea that you should be inspired is the wrong word, but that you should always be aware of, of the power of these hegemonic institutions through awe-inspiring performances, through awe-inspiring art that is grander, like the grandeur of the art, that the grandeur of the performances always needs to not only keep you entertaining, but keep you controlled. So we saw that with the performances of Autos de Fe. Here again, we have in the screen the Un Auto de, de Fe uh, in, in, our, in the La Parroquia de San Bartolomeo de Solotepec. We got into detail on, um, on all the different aspects of the composition, but this is exactly the, this is exactly the performance of, of the period of the Baroque, the idea that power is always being performed by the authorities. And in a way, in an indirect way, we or the general audience are also performing with, with them because without the participation of peoples in this sort of performances, they will have no meaning. They will have um, absolutely no meaning. And again, the conclusion of that, of that talk was precisely that images of autos de fe are in a way tied to text. And I also mentioned that in the colonial period, everything, all the visual culture, either it's tied to text. So either by um, by nature, because they're, they're, we're looking at religious images in relation to the Bible, 
or official documents. And in the case of Un Auto de Fe en el, en el Pueblo de San Bartolomé de Solotepec, it's tied to this autos generales that were written that give you all the details about the auto de fe. But I argue that, and this is from my thesis, I argue that el, el, the painting again here in the screen, this is the equal to the cover information that you will have in those autos um, generales. And here on the screen, you have a auto de fe. It's a, it's, a, um, it's a print. I don't have a lot of details, but I wanted to show you this because, again, this is supposed to be an auto de fe that took place in Mexico City, in one of the main plazas in Mexico City. But again, it shows you the grandeur that they built a whole entire stage. In fact, the biggest, the biggest auto de fe I think of the 17th century in both sides of the Atlantic was celebrated in Mexico City in 1649. The vice regal state staged the largest ever auto de fe in which 12 of the accused um, um, peoples were burned after being strangulated and one person, Tomás Treviño de Sobremontes, was burned alive since he refused to renounce his Jewish faith. The Inquisition also tried to accuse crypto Jews who had already died, removing their bones from Christian burial grounds and bringing them to the Auto de Fe. At the Gran Auto de Fe of 1649, this deceased convicted crypto Jews were burned in effigy along with their earthly remains. And this was such an incredible event that we know that, for instance, they created a stage in gradas and in, 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 um and seats that could that could serve or that could um, host 30,000 people. We know that people from all over the, um, the vice royalties, from uh, the different vice royalties of Spain, including the Philippines, were invited to this big auto. So it was a great opportunity for the vice royalty of New Spain, for the triangle of the hegemony again, the, um, the crown, the um, the church and the inquisition or the vice royalty, the, the triangle of power, of hegemonic power was um, enacted in this precise moment. But in this case in New Spain, it's almost like they were in competition. I don't know much of the details, but we know that a lot of people from different vice royalties were invited for the specific auto de fe. However, the performance of power was not just limited to um, autos de fe or, or, or performances of the Inquisition, as I mentioned. Instead, actually in Peru, in the Viceroyalty of Peru, one of the most powerful performances of power was done through the church. And this was in the processions of Corpus Christi. And here we have one of the parish of San Sebastian, and we have the detail of the procession of Corpus Christi. This is from around 1680. So it is around the late 17th century that we get more visual manifestations of these public performances in the visual culture of, of Latin American colonial art. So the parish of San Sebastián is a part of a series of 18 canvases, 16 of which survived that depict the religious festival of Corpus Christi in Cusco. These large paintings, they range from 6 feet square to 7, to, um, seven by 12 feet, were painted by at least two artists and were made by the, for the Santa Ana Parish Church in Cusco, located in the Andes Mountains. Corpus Christi, meaning the body of Christ in Latin, is a celebration of the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. You have no idea how long it took me to actually pronounce that word correctly. I will say transubstantiation. I will always get stuck. So the doctrine of transubstantiation, the transformation of the wine and bread of the Eucharist into the actual body and blood of Christ. The religious procession that accompanied this festival has been compared to ancient Roman triumphs, which generally celebrated military victories. In the painting, we see the Eucharist hosts, the sacramental bread, along with a, state of a, a statue of a saint paraded along a processional path. A bishop on the right, on the far right, um, we look at the image on the left, carries a monstrance containing the Eucharist host. And a monstrance is a vessel that is used to display the actual host. In addition to the bishop, other members of the San Sebastian parish community, including clergy members, um, government officials, and leaders of the indigenous Inca population were included in this procession. 
while elite citizens of Cusco witness the procession from their windows. And you can see these details. And that's kind of like the exciting part about some of the images that I'm going to show you today, that, that it shows you how the everyday population was activated, not was activated, but activated these paintings because without the presence, the, 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 the specific presence of certain sectors of the population, these performances will absolutely mean nothing because they will do, they won't do their job, which is again, this almost like enacting or activating this oppressive, oppressive um, era, again, the era of the, of the Baroque. Conveniently, Corpus Christi coincided with the Inca solstice celebration of Inti Raimi, or the Festival of the Sun. And remember, Inti is the god of the sun in the Inca tradition, leading to conflation of these festivities and aiding in Christian conversion efforts. In addition to the figures, we see a processional cart in the center, on top of which appears a statue of San Sebastián. These cards appeared throughout the series and were based on structures used for religious processions in Spain, celebrating the festival of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. The cards resemble ships' hulls and are modified from illustrations the artist in Cusco saw in a Spanish festival book. In this case, San Sebastián, who appears tied to a tree and pierced with arrows to represent his martyrdom, has replaced the actual images or statues of the Virgin Mary. Leading the procession, we see an Inca curaca who acts as a standard barrier. Also referred to as caciques, these local rulers of indigenous descent when granted privileges or cacicascos by the Spanish and allowed to maintain position of leadership after the Spanish conquest in the Indies, uh, the Andes, sorry. By the 17th century, 24 caciques held this hereditary office, making this an exclusive position. When we understand and when we see some of those details, we realize that how complicated things were. Because sometimes when we learn these things in school, they give us this Hollywood version of good versus evil, of victim versus colonizer. But actually, it was a lot more complicated. <clears throat> from day one, from the time that you have Christopher Columbus arriving into the Caribbean, we have the quote-unquote caciques or the indigenous leaders of those communities. They are um, aligning themselves with the power of Spain for many, many different reasons, including power, but also including survival. So when we think about a colonial period where it was just those colonized and the colonizers, it's a very reductive way of understanding um, and understanding the politics and in, in, um, as an extension, understanding the arts of this period. It's very, very complicated. And in this image, we see that. We see, for example, that you have to have the enacting of the power, not only from the church, but also from the caciques, from the great um, indigenous leaders. And that, again, served different functions. And um, one, of, one of them was to be specifically that, to show the rest of the population that the indigenous leader has been converted so they could continue um, their practices or just almost to reassure that the power of Christianity has taken over the power of indigenous of indigenous um, practices. The cacique depicting leading the procession in the parish of San Sebastián wears an Inca tunic, an unku. And we talked about uncus in some of the first videos of this new era of, of teaching. With modifications to incorporate Spanish costume elements like lace sleeves. The highly detailed garment, which includes a sun face on the front, is meant to indicate Andean nobility. The cacique crown also features a mascapaicha to distinguish his status. Again, the, the hat that we see that he is wearing, and that's something that we have seen in portraits from, for instance, from Guamampoma's book. This particular mascapaicha, the one that we see in this, in this painting, features a rainbow topped with a silver glove with feathers and banners, as well as two curinqueque birds, all typical of pre-Hispanic Inca novel insignia. And 
one of the things um, I wanted to remind you before I forget that a lot of this information and most of this information um, comes from different sources, from different um, from different sources online. This specific one came from Khan Academy, but I have um, gathered information from different museums around Latin America, um, from books, um, and I don't I I escape <laughs> I escape Chicago during the um, the beginning of the of the outbreak. We wanted to be with family, so I I don't have a lot of my sources, a lot of my books. So what I've been doing is replacing a lot of that information that I had from books with some online sources. So here and there, I'm gonna tell you, oh, go to this website, visit this, visit that. And unfortunately, this is not the canon, so we don't have a thousand different web resources relating to the colonial period. But there's a lot, and there's some in your syllabus, and some of them I'm going to give you as I as I talk. So this performance aided in converting the indigenous population to Catholicism and strengthening Spanish control. By wearing the mascapacha and other traditional costume details, this Inca elite embodied the pre-Hispanic rulers from whom they claimed to descend. This depiction of indigenous performance in a European Christian festivity draws attention to the conflation of Inca and Christian traditions that may allude to both a celebration of indigenous heritage as well as sovereignty nation to Spanish dominance. What is interesting also about this painting is the, the, the peoples on the bottom of the composition. You see them right here. And in a way, this could be an extension to um, like the Casta paintings that we're going to see or, made, or predating the Casta paintings that we're going to see, where you see the different castes, the different sectors of the population, of different classes, of different races, of different genders, of different backgrounds. And that's exactly what you see right here. Once again, it's to give you an idea that everybody's being converted. Everybody's paying attention. Everybody's participating. Without the participation of the everyday people, these costumes, these performances meant absolutely, absolutely nothing. And again, it's an imp gives you also an idea of the importance of this sort of rituals. Here is another image. Um, this image came from um, from the uh, website. The I think it was from Google Cultural. Um, I'll, I'll put the link in the video, but in this in this website, it, there's like different museums around the world that are adding their their collections, including um, including different museums in in Peru. And I found this fascinating image, and this related to what I've read and what um, or the scholarship more specifically of Carolyn Dean. She wrote an amazing book called Inca Bodies and the Body of Christ, Corpus Christi colonial Cusco, Peru. And in that book, she details some of the nuances behind um, Corpus Christi celebrations because they were particularly important for, um, for Peru. Celebrations of Corpus Christi became emblematic of the cultural conver convergence in Cusco since it marked the moment with the Christian and Inca calendars align. And as mentioned by Carolyn Dean, they coincided with celebrations of Inti. And this could represent a celebration of the triumph of Christianity over the god Inki. Inki, wow, over the god Inti. And I chose this particular image because we have all the elements also present on the other one. We have different sectors of the population, different classes, different races, different genders, different castes. Um, but note, for example, the gigantic statues of the different of the different saints, how they're covered in gold. So the power of Inti, in a way, it's it's also reflected on these statues. These statues also remind me of the statue paintings that we're going to see. And remember how I told you there is a special importance given in South America uh, uh, on, on textiles. So this, the use of gold, it's only, you can see it, it's only reserved to the actual sculptures. And the sculptures are covered in such a way that it's very ornamental, which reminds you of Inca textiles. So you have, think about, for example, the, the function of feathers in New Spain, the idea of the tonali in the Nahuatl tradition, the idea of the light of God reflected on feathers. Something similar is happening right here.
Think about the feather mosaics that we saw in class where you have the body of Christ that is covered in feathers, that is protected by the light of God. But here you see it in action. You see that procession and you see that light, not of, not the tonali, obviously, but the light of Inti that is activating this Catholic sculptures, this Christian, this Christian's um, belief. So I wanted to show you this. And there's so many different paintings of Corpus Christi that, that I was able to find, but I chose this particular one because it truly illustrates the point of Caroline Dean, the idea that it coincided, celebrations of Inti and celebrations of Corpus Christi coincided in dates, but also ideologically it for so many other reasons that we don't have time to cover right here. There's so many points of, of intersection that 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 show you why. They show you why this is so so important. And one of the great books about um, public performances or festivals in colonial Latin America was written by Linda Cursionage. And um, I hope that's how you pronounce um, her name. Um, and she wrote a book, The Great Festivals of Colonial Mexico, Mexico City. And she mentions, quote, individuals could experience these festivals and and I put this in between uh, the Autos de Fe and the Corpus Christi and the other festivals that we're about to see because this quote applies to all of these festivals in this lecture. Individuals could experience the festivals in different ways, adding to the power of such rituals of legitimacy because they had the ability to promote, to promote social cohesion, utilizing symbols and ritual acts that held diverse, even contradictory cultural meanings. So... What is fascinating about it, it's almost like the way or the function of big public um, um, like sports, like sports that are practiced in arenas that you can see on the TV, that you can see on a stadium. Think about soccer in Latin America. What do I mention that? Because even though they are a form of destruction to the population, at the same time, they are participating in these ideas of, of national cohesion. Think about the, the World Cup. The World Cup, it's all about nationalism. And you root it for your specific team. And while you think you're being entert only entertained, while you're like divorcing yourself from everyday life by just completely being emerged with the spectacle of the of the of the sport of the event at the end of the day you reinforce sentiments of na of nationhood sentiments of like national cohesion as as, as mentioned by by Linda and and this is very fascinating because while in the colonial period was more obvious that this was the almost kind of like that was the ending, especially the end of the festivals, especially um, when you think about Autos de Fe, this sort of thing still continue today and they just happen in different in different ways. But again, because they are presented to us as forms of, of, of entertainment, we don't think about it as that. Um, and it's the idea that, again, you think you're being just entertained, but at the same time you've been... Um, Repress. This is something that we refer to as repressive desublimation. And there's a psychoanalytical thing that could be problematic. I'm not going to get into it, but it's there's a whole theory of repressive desublimation of, of again, this type of, of hegemonic events. And as part of this festivals, as part of this visual culture, I decided to also add images of the city because festivals were also part of the everyday life. And as such, we have paintings like this, La Plaza Mayor de, de, um, de Lima. And in these in this compositions, we have a view of the everyday life. We have a view of the types of activities that are happening at all times in such an important place, such as the, the main plaza, because it's not just a static place. It's a place that is activated with all kinds of different symbols because of the space that is constructed, because of the meaning of the building surrounding it, because of the type of, of activities taking place. 
and we know for um, we know for instance that um, the the these celebrations that we're talking about aim at exalting the triumph of the church in painting. They were also an opportunity to showcase the beautiful Creole city. So many times you will have paintings of the processions of the entry of the Viceroy or or Corpus Christi, but you have this bird's eye view, and the idea is to show not only the power of those um, of those institutions, but at the same time to show these ideal cities, these ideal Creole cities. And we talked about the Creoles. We talked about how they're people of Spanish descendancy, of no, almost noble Spanish descendancy that are born in the Americas, that are starting to gain a pride for everything local. That's where we have... Um, artists like Correa and Villalpando in New Spain. Well, something similar is happening in South America. So the, this type of paintings are an opportunity to show that sort of um, pride, that pride into this um, um, like Creole cities that are developing all over Latin America. This was a painting that was created um, to commemorate the beatification of Toribio de Mogobrejo, if I'm not mistaken. And this casts an eye over its city and its everyday activities. The force of these images comes from the minute detail in all of the compositions and the ability to synthesize such so much information into one image. And that's something that I argue also for um, images of Altos de Fe, that we shouldn't look at those images with with an idea of European aesthetics. Instead, we have to look at those images again, that um, the, the, again, the force of these images comes from the minute detail in all of the composition and the ability to synthesize so much information into one image. So I want you to keep that phrase in mind as we look at these images that may be considered by some as just ugly paintings, but there's so much more to them. This was an excuse, this type of paintings are an excuse to show Lima as a unique, vibrant, cosmopolitan place. Again, it's all about Creole pride. It shows the diversity of the city and its people and commercial activity. The list on the right-hand side indicates the products available um, for sale in the main plaza. Lima's cathedral and their special palace are in the background. And on the left side is the Viceregal Palace. The plaza is represented from the point of view of the Cabildo, um, Cabildo building. And this is information that I gathered from an essay by Gabriel Roman in Bourbon Maneuvers in the Plaza Shifting Urban Models in Lake Colonial Lima. And midway throughout, um, through the 18th century, it was still possible to document several key markets characters in the square. First, you will see the tenderos or vendors who occupy the shops in the portals along the outer edges of the plaza. You also, this will include botoneros, button makers. On the south side, you will have escrivandos, notaries, um, and um, also present in the west side. Second, you will see the cajoneros who sold diverse products in movable kiosks or cajones placed in front of the Viceregal Palace on the north side. There's Bishop Palace and the Cathedral on the east side as well. Third, the Racauderas or Vivanderas or Abastecedoras, which were female vendors who sold food products dispersed throughout the square, the Mercachifles and Peddlers. Finally, the Negros Agarrilleros, a guild of black slaves who transported goods and water. The intense commercial activity associated with the plaza left an imprint on the surrounding street names, which are still named as such, botoneros, espanderos, guitarreros, um, etc., etc. Again, this is from Gabriel Ramon, Bourbon Maneuvers in the Plaza, Shifting Urban Models in Lake Colonial Lima. So again, we're getting an introduction of this of these cosmopolitan cities, that it's not only Mexico City. You see it in Lima, you see it in different places, and there's all kinds of different activities. And the idea behind these paintings, once again, is to give you a perspective that the city was alive. And think about it, if these images were somehow and in Spain, or prints of these images will be sent to Spain, the idea is to show the king, the idea is to show Spanish people that Creoles 
are developing and are creating this unique um, these unique cities that in so many different ways also could be compared to the big cosmopolitan centers in um, in Europe. And now we're going to look at um, this image uh, for a little bit because this is one of the most fascinating images of this of this lecture. This is about the entrance of the Viceroy Archbishop Morcillo into the city of Potosí. Now we are in Bolivia. The brief government of the Archbishop Don Diego Morcillo <laughs> as Viceroy of Peru has been documented as few others have been. Owing to the legacy of the painting by Olguin and the detailed chronicle created by Arsans Orsua. Through the canvas, we attend the reception held for the Viceroy at the Imperial Villa on April 25th or 1716, of 1716. Attending the reception, we see guests or as mayor as or, or, our, or we see guests, but also mayor spectators. And they're all members of the diverse society of 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 the vice royalties of South America. Arsans himself is there, a direct witness as the painter who depicts himself in the lower part of the painting besides his signature. And I'm going to t um, I'm going to escape a little bit of my PowerPoint and I'm going to take you to the internet because again if you go to arts um, arts and culture dot google dot com this is the website that i was telling you a lot of a lot of museums around the um, around the world have put their visual culture in here but you can have incredible incredible details so let's let's just look into detail into some of the things that happen right here so what we're going to show you first it's some of the details oh shoot some of the details on the top left of the composition so here we go. So in this part of the composition, because the painting is divided into three different times. So there's like different elements or different celebrations about the entrance of the Viceroy that are shown right here. So first, we're going to see, I'm going to start right here. Let's see the whole thing. First, we have the details of the lower part of the composition. And this basically, the lower half of the painting is filled with the large party which accompanies the prelate on his entrance to the, to the city. And look, um, if we actually get a close up, you see right here, this fool coming into the city. He looks fabulous. He has a canopy, all these people surrounding him. And then you have all kinds of different people that are not only looking and participating in the in the celebration, but they're also part of the desfile of the of the parade. So this is again one of the biggest manifestations of power that you ever going to see. And it's wonderful. And as scary as it is, but it's also wonderful that we could actually see it in, um, in, in painting. And then notice everybody. Everybody brings their best textiles to decorate their balcones. You see um, different paintings that um, I'm sure if we break it down, um, they will represent different allegories of the power of the Viceroy at this time. You can see people again in their balconies. You have, you see those chismosos just looking at all of the detail uh, 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 of the procession. Um, and then you have this wonderful detail of the actual uh, canopy that was constructed. It's a triumphal arch. And the, the, the tradition of triumphal arches dates back to the Roman period, but we'll come back and look at um, other um, triumphal arches from um, from Mexico City, from New Spain. So the upper part is horizontally divided into two mock canvases with the depiction of the event, the event which commemorated the historical day. The party went on through the night or to the following date. It included bullfights and masks, which blended portrayals of Sibyls and Incas. At the same time, the city was adorned with arches of triumph, tapestries, and canvases with allegorical mythical figures. They aimed to highlight the many virtues, virtues which graced the visitor and the city which received them. 
this was with the hope of obtaining favors from the highest authority. It's almost like people are going into their balconies and say, hey, look at me, look at me, I love you, I love you, I love you, please help. <laughs> Again, this was something that the powerful miners um, did not hesitate to spend money on and which they soon repented when they discovered that Morcillo's powers was to be the minimal given the brevity of this time in the office. They mourn the the 150,000 pesos quote, um, quote, quote, which would have been better spent elsewhere, as the chronicler lamented. So this was with the, again, so they did some of this, these big celebrations with the hope of getting some of these favors from, from him. Um, this was with the hope of obtaining favors from the highest authority, in particular for him to send a soges and restore the Indians from Mita. This was something that the powerful miners, again, did not hesitate to spend money on. So again, it's almost like celebrating the, the, the new viceroy to get favors, but also to forgive them for um, the, the, the intense labor of the time. We know, for example, that um, this is perhaps the only non-religious images image of non-devotional work of the oeuvre of the artist of Olguin. And we have different registers of the composition that, as I mentioned before, give us different celebrations. The first more official scene portrays the Viceroy's solemn arrival at the Iglesia Martriz. And this is exactly what we see right here on the screen accompanied by church officials from Potosí. Well, the second, and let's move to the second scene right here. It's the biggest colonial, apparently the biggest colonial gay party you've ever seen because notice it's only dudes right here on the bottom and all the women are here on the top. Todas chismosas just checking what all these men are doing. And look at this fool. Look at this fool. He's still in his carro just chilling, just being like, yes, kiss my hand, celebrate me, look at me, I owned everything. So the second scene is a nocturnal view of the same plaza and depicts a mask ball and parade performed for the entertainment of the queen, I mean of Morcillo, who observes the action from a canopied seat alongside the plaza. We know that this type of images are precisely what the scholar, um, his name was Richard Hagen in his famous book, Urban Images of the Hispanic World. This is what he, what he talks about in this magnificent book. If you don't have it, you should buy it. It's wonderful. He says, quote, the overarching idea, it seems, was to create an image of Postosi as a festive community whose loyalty to the monarchy superseded the, fa um, the factional divisions to which it was ordinarily subject. Such an image was idealized, but it tells us a great deal about the way Olguin and by extension other Potosinos, but above all the Creoles wanted their town to be remembered. And one last detail before I, before I forget, let's go aquí, nos subimos aquí arribita. You have a view of El Cerro Rico de Potosí. So again, it's highlighting not only this wonderful Creole city, but at the same time, the source, one of the reasons why this place is so attractive to the Spanish is because this is where like a lot of the silver that ended in, the, in Spain and different parts of the world comes from this. Potosí made the Spanish empire a rich, 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 rich empire. Also, some of the information that I'm getting from this specific image, and let's go back to our to our slideshow, comes from a thesis that I actually found online by Agnieszka A. Fisic, and I hope that's the way that you um, that you pronounce her last name, F I C E K. Again, Agnieszka Fisic, and this is a master thesis. But I was I read most of it, and I was fascinated by it. It, it was it was wonderful. It goes to show you to all those people that are pursuing their masters that you can write wonderful and contributing work even in the masters even in the master's um, level. 
Here's another painting that I learned about from this thesis, also from Agnieszka. She mentions, quote, In the 1758 description of the Cerro Rico and the imperial town of Potosí, which we see right here, which is in the collection, collection of Charcas in Sucre, the Verrio shows a similar interest in defining the architectural and geographical elements of the city. The painting includes a comprehensive guide to the natural and built environment within Potosí and its surroundings. While the most prominent element in the composition is the impressive mountain of Cerro Rico. Again, you have it right here in this composition and back here it's all the way to um, all the way to the back. The, um, while the most uh, while the most prominent element in the composition is the impressive mountain of Cerro Rico, dotted with entrances to the mines, the center of the canvas shows a vibrant city, radiating out in the harsh natural landscape of the Andes. In the in description, the Verrio created an expansive bird's eye view of the city, like the image that we saw of Holguin, his only secular painting. Originally commissioned by Don Francisco Antonio Lopez Ortega, this work provenance is even less known than that of the entry of the Viceroy. And she continues, Verrio's description of Potosí places a large emphasis on the Cerro Rico and the geographical surroundings of the city. In the top left of the composition, the Berrio has represented 18 of the 22 Cari Cari reservoirs, each of which had its own patron saint and chapel. In meticulous detail, the Berrio representation show the complex networks of roads and paths that connect the mines to the smelters and silver furnaces, or Uwairas, but any detail with regard the representation of the workers is absent. So this is kind of like what I was saying with the images of Autos de Fe, that you have this magnificent bird's eye view painting of the cities, of these events, but never we get the details of the everyday people. In the Auto de Fe, we didn't see the suffering of the victims of an Auto de Fe. And this person is mentioning, and Agnieszka is mentioning the same thing, that in this composition, we do get a sense of the richness that that the Sierra, that the 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 hill, the Cerro Rico, this this magnificent hill here on the back, has created, has given to the creation of the city, but also the development of the Spanish Empire. But we don't get anything in relation to the injustices of the of the workers, for example, um, in the mine of the mine. At the center of the painting, directly below the the rich hill, that's the, that's the translation of Cerro Rico, is the Plaza Mayor of the city. Radiating from the central point, the Verrio has depicted a curated view of urban life in Potosí, focusing primarily on the upper classes of the city who stroll leisurely throughout the city. So again, this is yet another composition that it's tied to power, that you have not only a perspective of events, not only a perspective, a verse I view of a city, but it's tied to the power of the minds. It's tied to the power of the, of the city. And here is a quote from Richard Kagan. Because one of the th reasons why I mentioned the book of Richard Kagan, it's because he calls these images um, communicentric um, images. You hear a blender in the background. Again, I cannot apologize because this is just the nature of things. I'm in a house with a lot of people. So you're going to hear kids screaming and food being made because this is a Mexican Latino household. And I cannot keep people quiet. And that is Okay. The communicentric view, while it often incorporated certain cartographical elements associated with description, generally did not pretend to offer a measured topographically accurate representation of a particular town. The communicentric view tended, therefore, to be purposely <laughs> idiosyncratic and filled with topographical distortions meant to enhance a town's size and overall importance. The communicentric projection singled out those locales that were integral to a particular community's definition of itself. So again, this is giving you an idea that these types of cities 
in a way are manipulating the information that they give you to enhance our experience of this Creole cities, our experience of the everyday life in this Creole cities. And this is nothing new to Latin America. The Europeans have been manipulating some of this, um, this vedutes or some of these views of the cities. And later we get in the 18th century, um, people like Canaletto who rearranged the buildings of the Grand Canal in order to give you more of a grand view. So something similar has been happening in Latin America for, for a long, long time. And in relation to that um, triumphal arch, I didn't give you a lot of information of that specific triangle because I wanted to talk about another important triangle arch. And this one was the one decorated and created for Marques de la Laguna. And the information that I'm giving you right here, it's a reproduction because we know that the program for the um, for this triumphal arch, for the entrance of the Marques de la Laguna was created in 1680. And it was created by Carlos de Siguenza y Góngora, which is one of the most important Creole writers, not the, one of the most, the most important Creole writers of the colonial period. And, and he actually published, he published um, an essay um, entitled Teatro de Virtudes Políticas que Constituyen a un Príncipe. Theater of vir uh, Political Virtues that Constitute a Prince. And Rey Hernández Durán, who wrote about this arch, notes, quote, This Teatro de Virtudes Políticas que Constituyó un Príncipe provides a detailed analysis of a triumphal arch that he designed in honor of the incoming Viceroy, the court of Paredes Marqués de la Laguna and his wife, the new Viceroy. The text presents a formal description of the arch-painted facades, which depict the 12 Aztec rulers here associated with virtues such as wisdom, loyalty, valor, or valor, and the first 12 viceroys of New Spain, as well as local quote-unquote Mexican emblems, such as the nopal or cactus and the eagle. Typically, identified with Greek or Roman deities and heroes, the Viceroy was seen, among other things, as a Christian prince, a savior and a father. The Siwensin Gongora, for example, referred to the Viceroy in biblical terms as the husband, as the husband at the door who enters and joins the council elders, a reference captured by the Viceroy's literal movement throughout the arch not through the arch, into his position at the head of the viceregal, viceregal hierarchy of the imperial capital. Anna Moore talks about these types of commissions and this painting that you see right here, this is not the painting that belongs to this arch. This actually was an arch that was created for the entry of the Marques de las Amari uh, Amarillas. And if I'm not mistaken, this arch was actually mounted into the, uh, into the entrance of the Cathedral of Mexico City. I may be wrong. It could be another, another church. And in this, in the, in, in, um, Anna Moore mentions, quote, the commission of the arch for the arch um, of, of um, Count Laguna, Marques de la Laguna, sorry, um, provided the two young members of the Creole elite and in parallel public forum to make, make their names. And I will say there were different members of the Creole elite. First, we have Carlos de Siguenza Góngora. The second will be Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, who wrote an interpretation about the different, um, about the um, the arch that was created by his friends because they were, they were bodies. And then the third will be Juan Correa, who was the painter who would have created some of the images illustrating the allegories that were created by Siguenza Góngora. And I mentioned and I bring the specific paintings into the screen because this gives you a better perspective of how these arches would have looked like. Again, they would have been constructed only for a little bit of time. So there's none of them that have survived. So this type of paintings are incredibly important because they give us an idea of how they were constructed. The architectures, the architecture behind these arches is very classical and um but also very, um, very local because we start to see details of this uh, quote unquote Baroque architecture that is very common, especially throughout the 18th century in different cities of Mexico. 
So the allegories they chose for their respective arches, however, betrayed a marked discrepancy in their political stances towards viceregal authority. For her arch, Neptuno Allegorico, or Allegorical Neptune, Sor Juana created emblems based on the resonances between the title of the entering viceroy, Laguna, and the lake on which Mexico City was built. But I also read somewhere that because Sor Juana Inés, if you don't know who she is, Google it. We talked about it in class before. Um, she's an the most important poet in Latin American history, I dare to say. Um, she um she also not only talks about the the Marques como Visrey de la Laguna um in relation to Neptune, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, but it's almost like she's making fun of the authorities because Mexico City was regularly being flooded. <laughs> so it's almost like they are the gods of this lake city, not because of the virtues of the of of the greek and roman gods but instead because of the faults in uh, in conducting regular businesses in mexico city or or keeping the city from not flooding um and sor juan Inés de la cruz did that a lot she always wrote criticisms towards the vice royalties but she did it in such a smart way my gosh, she did it in such a way that people never find out. Not never, but they at the time they didn't know that she, this is exactly what she was, what she was, um, what she was doing. And if it was fortune that determined that at some point the Mex Mexican monarchs were to emerge from the ashes of oblivion, so that like phoenixes of the West, they could be consecrated to immortal fame, that there was never a better time than the present since it is your excellency who will infuse them with spirit. This is Carlos de Siguense Gongora writing about the, the virtues of the new viceroy. But it is so fascinating to think about, for instance, the fact that you have these Creoles creating this European-like arch with exalting the virtues of the new viceroy, but also comparing it with Mexica monarchs. That's something that it almost seems blasphemic if you think about it. But this is a way for the um this is a way for the Creoles to define their nationhood, the beginnings of the nationhood. And I dare to say nationhood because this reminds me a lot of what Claudio Lamnitz writes about. And um, and Claudio Lamnitz tells us that there's ideas of nationhoods in different areas of the different vice royalties. But the nations who's, the nationhoods of the different vice royalties are created to attach themselves to the overarching idea of patria, the fatherland, which is Spain. Many times, the few uh, privileges that citizens in Spain will have will not be extended to the populations of New Spain in the same way. However, the Creoles had more than any other casta um, had the type of rights that some of those citizens in Spain had. So in a way, this sort of arches, this sort of programs, this sort of public performances was to reiterate that they were an extension of the, of the, of the patria, of the fatherland, that their nation, that the Creole nation that they are creating, that they are developing um, the history of, and the, um, that they are also developing their, um, their own legends and own myths that are tied to Rome, to Greece, and also to the Aztecs, that that nation that they're forming is an extension to, um, to Spain on the other side of El Charco, on the other side of the ocean. So again, you can see how the the the, the importance of this type of images, because they're not just to show you a city that is alive, as I mentioned before, but it's it's all of that. It's to show the power of 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 the hegemonic triangle. And as I said before, it shows the power of the caciques, the power 
of the of the creels the way that the creels are trying to align themselves to the power of the king the way that the caciques in a way have been manipulated to align their power with the um with the crown it's very complicated one of the reasons why we don't hear a lot um when it comes to the colonial power because hollywood teaches us and history teaches us that it's supposed to be more binary that it's black and white that is good versus evil but at all points at all turns when it comes to the colonial period we have layers upon layers upon layers upon layers upon layers that complicate the history and the history of the caciques and the history of the creoles shows us that and what is amazing about that is that we get some of that information and some of that um and some of the complicated history through visual culture through some of these images so not only do we have a celebration of the entrance of the viceroy, but we also get celebrations when they died because, you know, they get all kinds of different parties at all times. So when they died was yet another opportunity for the crown or the viceroyalty to show their power. The custom of holding funeral rites to commemorate the death of a member of the royal family begins in Spanish America with the death of the Emperor Carlos V or Charles V, frequently held weeks and even months after the actual burial of the body had occurred elsewhere, the exequias or obsequies were obsequies, I don't know how to pronounce that, exequias were complete with catafalque, candles, and casket. The tumulo, that's how we call these constructions that you see right here on the screen, or catafalque, was the temporary decorative architectural monument built out of wood, canvas, and stucco. So again, kind of like the Triumphal Arch, these were not permanent constructions. Usually they were Latin with figurative and ornamental sculpture, paintings, emblems, and inscriptions. They were constructed in the crossing at the church before the main altar and serve as a centerpiece for this plate of the symbolic uh, representation. The inscriptions usually included poetry in the form of sonnets or odds in praise and to glorify the deceased person. The exequias with tumulos have been described as displays in which all the arts combine to adorn a social occasion and as opportunities for elaborate artistic expression, which receive the care and thought of the best talent available. So again, very similar to the, um, to the arches. The work of architects, painters, writers, and sculptors, um, the tumulo reveals the social, cultural, religious lives of the time and place. In the case of exequias held upon receipt of the royal cedula or royal letters patent, the tumulo served as a vehicle of political propaganda. Surprise! Everything in the colonial period was a vehicle for political propaganda. Here we have a construction of one that was created for 1744. The exequias with tumulos have been described as, quote, displayed in which all of the arts combine to adorn a social occasion and as opportunities to elaborate an artistic expression. And they receive the care and thought of the best talent available. I think I already mentioned that, but it's okay if I read it again because it's so important. Um, the work of architects, painters, and writers and sculptors, as I mentioned before, was, was present. And we have several examples of that, but nothing that has actually survived. Because just like everything, these are just... Um, uh, are constructions that were just created for that specific occasion. But imagine going inside of a church, seeing this multi-level construction made out of canvases and wood, decorated with paintings, with allegories, with candles. It would have been an impressive spectacle that once again reiterated the power of the person that died. And this would have been, for the most part, for a viceroy, um, vicereen, a king or a queen. The total height of this structure, for instance, the one that we see right here that was created in 1701 for Charles, Charles, Charles II was 171 feet and the two pyramids standing outside at the corners were 36 feet high. There were figures representing Europe, 
Asia, Africa, and America standing on the second cuerpo, on the second body. Think about the the um, the the biombos or the folding screens that we saw with the Mexico City in the front, a view of Mexico City in the front, and in the back you have personifications of the different parts of the world. It's a way for the Creoles to integrate their history in, or, or, or to show that they have a place in global politics, in um, they're part of this globalized world. Well, something similar is happening right here, that the body of the king the body of the viceroy, it is part of the body of the world, that the body of the country of La Patria belongs to this world, worldly stage. Africa was a half-nude black man, and America was a half-nude red man wearing a headdress of black and yellow feathers. Shit doesn't change. <laughs> the same stereotypes that we saw from the first maps that we saw in class from the 16th century continue throughout the 17th century and 18th century and 19th century and 20th century and 21st century. I'm tired. There were 20 allegorical paintings on the first body and soclo, including images of the following, a palm tree, two columns, the city of Lima, the river Rimac, a pelican plucking out its heart to feed its young, a resting lamb, a dead lion, Ganymede, Prometheus, a ship, a pomegranate tree, a crown skeleton, a sunflower, and a castle. The top figure was, of course, a phoenix. It's the idea of almost like almost like a Christ-like figure that a figure that resuscitates and then goes up to to um to heaven. So again, the the type of of the type of public celebrations were very common in the colonial era. This is again what we refer to as the the period of awe, and people had to be transformed at all times. They had to be reminded of the power of the colonial power, and that was manifested through um, performances of the Inquisition, through performances of the entrance of the Viceroy, the death of the Viceroy, Corpus Christi, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, when we think about the colonial period, I want you to think of that, not only um, in relation to some of the religious images that we've seen, but the performance of power was not limited to going inside a church and look at, at at paintings of the Trinity, for instance, or of the life of Mary and Christ. But instead, power had to be performed at all, all times. I have a lot of other images that I wanted to show you, but we ran out of time. And besides, these images pertain mostly to New Spain as opposed to other um, to South America. So I think this is a good point to stop because this is the last the last of the South American um, visual and material culture that we're going to talk about, at least for now. So the next videos are going to be about the 18th century in New Spain. And depending on time, we will go back to um, South America and just show you a couple of more images from the 18th century. So again, take care of yourselves, um, take care of your elders, cover your mouth, um, be safe, wear gloves, everything that you have to do so we can, um, so that we can meet again in the classroom. I miss you guys <laughs> and ladies and everybody. I miss you and it is important to have human interaction. And I feel like this new era is going to change a lot of things, but hopefully not the nature of the classroom. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.